um, we are, the transition is still ongoing. Uh, we've had, as you know, a, a change of president yes. um, and uh, a change in government. Um, but really, the Prime Minister's party um, is a minority uh, in parliament. So, um, and just recently, they've formed a national unity government. The expectation is that there will be a general election. Uh, it has to take place before April next year. Uh, but in my view, certainly from the point of view of uh, having clarity in terms of economic strategy, the sooner the election, the better, because everybody is waiting to see uh, what the right. uh, strategy is going to be. So we're waiting on that. So in a way, we are still in a, the transition is, uh, we're in a kind of a transitional interregnum, one could say, <laughs> as far as economic policy making is right. concerned. Uh, you know, you've been uh, talking a lot about the uh, interplay between growth and welfare. Uh, yeah. It's a issue, I guess, is that's important to Sri Lanka as it is to India too. Uh, what, why is, what's the reason that you, you focus so much on this off late? Sure, sure. You know, uh, historically, Sri Lanka has a wanted reputation in terms of its social development. Mm -hmm. It's uh, social indicators, uh, you know, in terms of its achievements uh, in relation to the Millennium Development Goals, in terms of its achievements in relation to the Human Development Index of the UNDP. All that Sri Lanka is an outperformer. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it punches well above its weight in terms mm -hmm. of its level of development. Mm -hmm. However, we uh, don't do quite as well if you look at the broader development picture. You know, at the time of independence, Sri Lanka was second to Japan mm. in terms of several socioeconomic indicators. It was ahead of South Korea and Singapore even as late as 1965, per, higher per capita income. Mm. But you look at where those countries are and where Sri Lanka is today. So my kind of general thesis has been that while we have done well in terms of social development, we have not got the balance between social development and wealth creation right. Now you could argue, well, what does that matter? You know, you've got good outcomes. But it's difficult for us to argue that we have got good outcomes. Because if you look at what has happened, we have had two youth insurrections in the south of the country in 1971, 1988-89. Thousands of young people died. Then we had a separatist mm -hmm. conflict, you know, for 27 years. Again, thousands of young people died. And for me, the, there is complex causality, particularly you know, on both issues, uh, particularly the separatist mm -hmm. thing. But the underlying um, causal factor for me has been the fact that the system has not met the aspirations of young people in our country. We have educated them, raised their uh, expectations, but we haven't been able to provide them with opportunities. And that's in some senses is highlighting the larger problem which India faces too. Uh, similar, mm. similar. So we need to really get the balance right. And like India now, we have started focusing on infrastructure. Uh, we need to create a more enabling environment for investment. You know, Sri Lanka is a small country. Now, in the last five, six years, <coughs> our growth model has essentially been based on commercial foreign borrowing, financed infrastructure development. But that model is running out of headroom because of the debt dynamics. The external debt dynamics are such that we can't continue borrowing and building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. For a country with a population of 21 million, a market size of 21 million, the only way you can have sustained 8-10% growth, we want to achieve that in the way India wants to, is through FDI-led export expansion. That is what all the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia have done, and that's the model we have to follow. So what I've been saying is we need to get much leaner and meaner. You know, in, historically, we were a donor darling. Mm. You know, we had a liberal polity, a liberal, we liberalized way back in 1977. You know, India did it in 91, we did it in 77. So the donors were very generous. But in a way, that kindness uh, meant that we didn't take the tough decisions mm. in terms of structural reform. So what I've been saying is now we need a kind of laser-like focus on productivity, on competitiveness, rather than, you know, this focus on handouts and, and giveaways. Now, we've had uh, two budgets, uh, one in November uh, to 2014 by the previous government. There was a bunch of handouts. Then we had an interim budget from the new government, more handouts. Lee Kuan Yew, the late Lee Kuan Yew, um, said about Sri Lankan elections that it's an auction of non-existent resources, <laughs> and he was not far off the mark. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, uh, that's what I've been really trying to convey that we need to get away from that entitlement culture much more to a focus 
on creating a good investment climate to get FDI driven export expansion. But that is not to say that one should not have a good social protection system. That is not to say that we must focus on education, training and skills development to empower people so that they can participate in a modernizing economy. So the, you know, the equity considerations are important, but the way to meet that is not through handouts and giveaways, which are not sustainable, mm. because our fiscal situation is such, we have fiscal space that we can't do it, but rather through empowering people through education and training, right. and creating a good investment climate right. to create the employment. Right. Yeah, the last question. You talked about investment climate. So there's a lot of Chinese investment that is uh, coming into Sri Lanka or has come in. I mean, are you, as an independent economist, are you comfortable with that? Uh, do you see strings being attached? And yeah. if so, what could that happen? How could that sort of play well, out? Up to now, it has mainly been Chinese loans. Mm. Uh, there has been a little bit of investment into the port of Colombo. Uh, and they've, I think now they've offered some investment into the Northern Highway. But it's really been loans, not investment. Yeah. So we've got to shift, uh, certainly we want Chinese FDI or Indian FDI or FDI from anybody else, but we have to make that shift from commercial loans mm. to FDI. Mm. Um, so my own view is if we create a, a good uh, investment climate, then hopefully we can attract investment from everywhere, and including China, particularly because China has a lo lot of capital, and they're in a capital exporting phase. They're encouraging their companies to go abroad. So you know, by all means, we should attract Chinese investment. Um, but there have been one or two, uh, for instance, there is this Port City investment, which has been controversial. Yep. Um, there, the current government basically is saying that the procedures have not been followed properly, that the environmental impact assessment has not been completed properly, that there are some issues regarding, you know, the way the land, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a development of 233 hectares. The Chinese are going to be given 20 hectares on freehold and another 88 hectares on a 99-year lease. Now, I hear the legislation around those processes, it, particularly the freehold, there are issues. So the legal framework, uh, there are question marks. There are question marks regarding the, um, the environment impact assessment. And the government says it's reviewing the project. But it will go ahead if it can sort mm. things out. I mean, we should be open to FDI from anywhere. Right. But of course, we need to be conscious. We are within India's security perimeter. Mm. Right, so I mean, you know, we have to be realistic and conscious about that. That's a geopolitical reality. Mr. Kornaswamy, thank you so no much problem. for speaking with us. No problem.